From Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio, it's The Big Take. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, aluminum's long, dirty trip from the Amazon to the U.S. The Ford F-150 pickup truck is the best-selling vehicle in the U.S. and has been for decades. And when the company unveiled the all-electric version called the Lightning, it was an immediate hit and sold out. One advantage of electric over gasoline-powered vehicles is, of course, that the motor is cleaner and causes less pollution. That's not always the case, though, when it comes to other parts on the vehicle. Like all cars and trucks, the F-150 Lightning is made with a lot of aluminum, hundreds of pounds of it. And some key parts are made with aluminum that would be hard to call environmentally friendly. Bloomberg senior correspondents Sheridan Prasso in Washington and Jessica Bryce in Sao Paulo, Brazil, trace some aluminum parts on the F-150 EV back through a complex supply chain to the heart of the Amazon in Brazil. Thousands of residents are now suing a refiner that operates there. They claim the aluminum industry has made their water undrinkable, that it's harmed the Amazon's fragile ecosystem, and it's made them sick. Sheridan and Jessica are here now to tell us what they found and how Ford has responded. Sheridan, what first made you want to look into this story? So sometime last year, I heard about a lawsuit against this company called Norsk Hydro. It's a Norwegian company. It has offices around the world. It has a refinery for alumina in Brazil, in the Amazon region. And the people who live around it filed a class action lawsuit. The suit represents 11,000 people who live around the refinery. They are suing the company for causing environmental damage and affecting the health of the community. That is what they claim in the suit. The company denies these claims and says its operations meet Brazilian laws and environmental requirements. Sheridan, let me ask you, because we're going to hear a number of terms here, what is the difference between alumina and aluminum? How is aluminum actually made? So what happens is there's a rock in the ground called bauxite. That is red colored. And mining companies take it out of the ground They grind it all up into a powder and dry it out and send it for processing at an alumina refinery. The refinery turns that red bauxite into a white powder called alumina. It separates the red and leaves just the white. That white powder is then what is used for the smelting process to turn it into aluminum. And that very complicated, kind of messy, dirty process is at the heart of these lawsuits and the complaints that people have about the environment and their own health. I want to talk to people both at the site of the mine itself that's located in the center of the Amazon in a a national forest area, in fact, in the rainforest. And I also talk to the people who live around the Illumina refinery down at the end of the Amazon River. And in both of those places, people cited environmental damage and damage to their health as a result of these processes. Jessica, this alumina, which comes from Brazil, winds up in many different products around the world. Is that right? It does. Some of the aluminum is processed into aluminum here in Brazil, but a lot of it goes to North America and Europe. Generally, the aerospace industry, the automotive industry, and the beverage industry use a lot of this alumina in aluminum. And what we focused on is how this aluminum ends up in the Ford F-150. And the reason we chose the F-150 is because when Ford announced that they were making the all-electric F-150 EV Lightning last year, a lot of the auto parts companies, which don't normally reveal who their customers are, supply chains tend to be a black box, announced that they are supplying parts to the F-150. And we didn't know that information previously. So what that allowed us to do is to be able to trace all of those aluminum parts suppliers. If you look backwards, goes back to Canada where the aluminum is smelted from the alumina that comes from Brazil. And 90% of the alumina that Canada uses to turn into aluminum 
comes from this region of the Amazon. But another reason that we chose the F-150 to focus on is because when Ford announced their electric vehicle, they said, this is the truck of the future. And they asked, can a truck change everything? And the key to transitioning, as the Biden administration is pushing, the key to transitioning to a more environmental future is getting middle America, the rest of America, not just people who buy Teslas in California or uh, the East Coast, but people who drive pickup trucks, if you can convince these people that electric vehicles are the future, that changes everything. And so that's why we chose Ford, because it's iconic, it's the best-selling pickup truck in America and has been for decades. Once we started tracing it, it turned out that the aluminum that is made from this alumina, from this bauxite in the Amazon, is in the exterior panels of the F-150. It's in something called a rocker that runs from the front door to the back door underneath the doors. It's in other parts, including the tubing for the frame on the interior of the cab. It's very, very hard to find any aluminum in the supply chain that is not touching the Amazon. Jessica, long before this aluminum is used in parts for the Ford F-150 Lightning. It has its origins deep in the Amazon. Can you explain the start of this process? The very beginning of this supply chain is in the heart of the Amazon at a mine called MRN. That mine's been operating for decades, and when it originally started operating, the emphasis on environmental protection wasn't as great. They went out there and they polluted a lot of the water. Um, They dumped a lot of the waste. And communities there are still suffering from that. MRN now says that they have an open dialogue with a lot of the folks who live around in these communities. They say they test the water to make sure that the pollution is not happening. But they are still located in the middle of a nationally protected forest. And some of the expansion that they want to do now, they want to expand quite dramatically into that forest, it overlaps with a protected area known as a Kilimbola, which is land that's been set aside for descendants of formerly enslaved people. Just the fact that it's in the middle of a national rainforest in the Amazon, it's going to have to deforest a lot of that land in order to get to that bauxite. If you talk to MRN, their executives say that there's a real difference in perception about what the local communities say is happening to them and what the mine says it's actually doing. The mining company studies the water and sends those studies to the uh, environmental regulator every year. We weren't able to get that data, but they say that those studies show that the water is okay for those folks. However, the perception of the communities is that it's not at all okay. And what we're really talking about here is that the lack of law in Brazil to protect these communities and to prevent this sort of pollution from happening or monitoring it or catching it, it's just not there. MRN is operating within the laws of Brazil. It's just that the laws are incredibly weak. Sheridan, we think of the Amazon as being wild and remote, but in fact, the area around this mine has a lot of people living around it. Is that right? The mine is located in such a huge area that is surrounded by water on at least three sides of it. Communities are dotted all along the area where the mine is located. It's important to note, and when I went to the mine and talked to the people all along the periphery, what they say is the mine itself is located on a plateau. It's higher elevation, and the river is below. So what happens is rainwater and just kind of the natural process of ecosystems means that the waste that's generated, even if done in the most ecologically sound way possible, still flows down to their communities. And so what they told me was that because of this runoff problem from the plateau and because of the damage that had been done over the decades, they are facing issues including the loss of their fish in the water that they relied on for their livelihood. They can't drink the water any longer. If they bathe in it, they their skin gets itchy. In certain seasons around a lake that 
MRN filled up with mine tailings in the 80s. The mine tailings are still there. And in the dry season, the lake dries up, red mud is visible, fish nearby turn red. If they eat those fish, they get sick. Sheridan, you spoke to one woman who lives along the Amazon and has been affected by this. I spoke to Maria Dilma Dos Santos, who lives on the edge of Batata Lake, where MRN had dumped their mining waste back in the 80s. It's still affecting their lives profoundly every day. The water becomes like this, colored, all red, full of bubbles. It gets dirty, like mud, really. When it comes and dries, it's like mud. You can't see anything at the bottom. Even our feet, when we dip them in, we can't see anything. It's like mud, half white, half red. It's worse if we dip our feet in. Sheridan, you also asked this same woman whether she thinks the water will ever get cleaned up. No, no. Because to go in, this lake is very big and there's no way to clean it. Unless Jesus came down and said he was going to clean it because he has the power to do so. But I don't think there's anyone's machine that could clean it. The box seat is a lot. So much. These are communities, and this is a region that's just extremely remote. It is very difficult to get there. And these communities are traditional communities that still live very much by, you know, fishing and what they can gather, what they can hunt. Any sort of pollution or any threat to that is a threat to their their livelihoods. They don't have options. There aren't roads to these areas. They don't have options to go out and get other supplies or help or other water. When I asked people living around the mine how profoundly they are affected by the pollution, it became clear that it's become even a part of their identity. One of them, Raimundo da Silva, who's 79 years old, started singing a song that he wrote about witnessing these changes over his lifetime. Muito lindo é o céu, mais bonito é o mar, mas é feia a nossa água que ninguém pode tomar. Está na cara, está na vista, a grande poluição da sujeira da bauxita que vem da mineração. So this mine, MRN, pulls up the bauxite. And what happens from there? They run it along a railway that goes to a port that is along a tributary of the Amazon River. At that port, they load it onto ships, big hulking container ships, and they fill the holds of those ships with powdered bauxite that's been uh, ground up. And they take it 800 miles down the Amazon River to where the Amazon empties into the Atlantic Ocean, which is where the refinery is located. And Sheridan, you traveled down the Amazon behind one of these boats, is that right? What did you find? As we went down the Amazon River, it's just an incredibly beautiful landscape, of course, as you can imagine, and infinite shades of green and missionary churches all dotting along the sides. And then right in the middle, these big hulking container ships with tons of bauxite heading towards the refinery. There's a real disequilibrium between the beautiful nature and the actual processes of getting this bauxite out of the middle of the Amazon. It skirts the equator and then comes back around to the refinery, which is located right at the heart of where the Amazon meets the Atlantic Ocean. Jessica and Sheridan, please stay with me. Our conversation continues after the break. Jessica, once those giant container ships emerge from the river and reach the refinery, what happens next? So the bauxite is unloaded at a couple refineries that are there. There's the Alo Norte refinery, which is the one that we focused on. The bauxite's unloaded, brought into that refinery where it's turned into aluminum. Just to note here for a second, we're saying Norsk Hydro and Alo Norte, but 
These names are also sometimes pronounced Norse Hydro and Alu Norche. Sheridan, just as people complain about health and environmental problems as a result of the mining of this bauxite, people who live around the refinery also say that that process makes them sick. The lawsuit representing 11,000 people who live in that community says that because of many, many years of environmental pollution that they say is caused by the refinery, they suffer terrible health problems, including hair loss and neurological problems. People report birth defects, including babies being born with their intestines outside their bodies. They say they have cancer and higher mortality than in other communities. Studies of the lead and aluminum content in these people's bodies shows levels that are far, far higher than what is allowed for normal states of health. The water is not drinkable around the refinery. And in fact, Norsk Hydro provides free water to the community because the water can't be drunk. Sheridan, you spoke with Alu Norte. What did they say about the things you're describing? So Alu Norte and its owner, Norsk Hydro, deny any and all environmental pollution say they're operating completely within Brazilian standards and that there is zero effect from them in the community. I suppose now that is what this lawsuit seeks to sort out. So the Brazilian lawyer who's bringing the case had tried five times already to sue Alunorte and its owner, Norsk Hydro, in courts in Brazil. Did not make any progress on those cases. Those are all still pending. Then he teamed up with a global law firm and brought the case in the Netherlands. So that case is in Rotterdam District Court now. The court ruled that they do have jurisdiction over what's going on in Brazil because Norsk Hydro has subsidiaries and operations in the Netherlands. So that case is scheduled to be heard sometime in the coming months. Jessica, you said just a minute ago that Alu Norte and MRN operate within Brazilian law. How is it that the Brazilian government allows this to happen? Why would they not want to protect the Amazon, which is sort of the beating heart of Brazil? It comes down to, you know, the commodities market. I mean, Brazil is a commodities powerhouse. So when you're talking about Amazon deforestation, the government is not doing their own studies of this water, uh, and they're not doing their own studies of the health effects. Do you expect that there will be closer scrutiny of this going forward? I expect there to be closer scrutiny of environmental damage going forward. The environmental regulator, the headcount there and the resources that they have access to was gutted. And that wasn't just under the administration of former President Jair Bolsonaro. Of course, he accelerated it. But that started years ago, years and years ago, because Brazil was in a very serious recession, embroiled in a very serious corruption scandal. So this is more than a decade in the making in which the environmental regulator has no teeth whatsoever. So the environmental agency, it's, it acknowledges that it can't test water quality around the MRN mine, but it does do inspections. And over the past two decades, it's fined MRN 29 infractions, totaling $6.6 million. And they say that they've only received 10% of that amount. I would like to give an example of the difference between what's going on on the ground and the environmental regulation. Norsk Hydro invited me in to Alanorte, gave me a tour with a hard hat and a protective equipment and everything, and showed me all of their procedures for how they purify water and that they're good environmental stewards. That's what they told me. During that visit, I asked them about the emissions from the refinery. Alanorte burns coal. Every day in the morning at dawn and the evening at dusk, people say, and you can see this visibly, that there are emissions, big clouds, plumes that come out of the refinery. They call it smoke, and they say that that makes them choke, cough, and it feels like pepper in their throats. I asked Eleanorte about this, and what they said is, it's just steam. It's just water vapor. And I pressed them and said, but, you know, people say it's making them cough and choke. And they said, No, all of our emissions meet environmental standards. So I went back to Norsk Hydro's annual report. 
In the report, it shows that burning coal from the Ala Norte refinery emits a large amount of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, and their CO2 emissions are, and I calculated this, the equivalent of what Iceland produces in an entire year. And so when they say we're following the law, they're correct. Correct. So it's important to note that Alu Norte is not the only industrial factory in the Bacarena area. It's an industrial hub in the north of Brazil. And even at Alu Norte itself, there were a lot of accidents and spills that occurred before Norsk Hydro took over the refinery. Now the bauxite has been turned into alumina, and it begins another long journey. It's loaded onto ships at the refineries in Brazil, and then it goes to at least the part that ends up in the U.S. supply chain. It goes up to Quebec. And in Quebec, there are refineries that are owned by Rio Tinto and by Alcoa. Those refineries turn the alumina into aluminum. That aluminum is what comes back into the United States and turns into all of the parts. What do those smelters have to say about the source of the alumina that they're getting? The two companies that own the aluminum smelters in Quebec, and there are multiple smelters owned by these two companies, they have or have had ownership stakes in MRN Mine and the refineries that make the alumina both. So they know exactly the whole supply chain because they're part of the producers of it in the first place. Secondly, when you ask them about it, what they say is everybody along the whole process says, we certify our standards, everything is certified by the Aluminum Stewardship Initiative, and everybody is required to sign supply chain code of conduct agreements. The problem with the certification process is, according to Human Rights Watch, which has challenged it, is that it's not rigorous enough. It's a box-ticking exercise in some cases, which just relies on what the company has to say. And Norsk Hydro has a very clear point of view that they don't cause any environmental damage at all whatsoever in the Amazon. That's what they say. And that's what the certifiers of this aluminum supply chain hear. What they say also is that they're relying to some degree on other sources But according to Human Rights Watch and others who criticize this process, it's not thorough enough. And yet from the beginning of the supply chain all the way to the end, each of the points along the way can claim that they are following the law and everything that they're doing is legal. And it is. Both the MRN mine and the Ala Norte refinery are certified as meeting environmental standards. We'll be right back. Sheridan, what did Norris Hydro say when you asked them about your reporting? When I first looked to make the links between the lawsuit in Brazil against Norris Hydro and the fact that they said in an announcement that they make a part for the F-150 EV, I went to Brazil, did all of the reporting around the refinery, and asked Norris Hydro about the connection. And what they said was, oh, well, we don't source from Brazil for the part that we make for Ford. So I thought, how is it then that they're getting the aluminum in that case? So I started digging through shipping records. And what I was able to do is trace the chain from the alumina refinery in Brazil to Quebec, where it is turned into aluminum and then comes back, shipped back to the United States using U.S. import customs records. And by saying that we don't source from Brazil to our U.S. factory, what they omitted from that statement was that it goes via Canada. Once I found all of the aluminum smelters in Canada are using this very same alumina from the Alanorte refinery, I was able to trace it to all of the aluminum in the F-150, at least what's visible on the exterior. After I went back to them and said, I have found your shipping records that show that you are making the aluminum in Canada and then bringing it to the U.S., they confirmed that that was correct. Having studied a lot of different supply chains, commodity supply chains, 
This is a common practice in the industry, whether you're talking about beef production, you're talking about metals production. A lot of companies, when they say in their marketing campaigns that we are responsibly sourcing our raw materials, they're only talking one step back. All commodities chains have several steps back. I mean, it's a very long, complicated process that extends to halfway across the world. And so it feels very disingenuous when you say we're responsibly sourced, but you're only looking at your direct supplier. You also went to Ford. What did they say about your reporting on the source of aluminum used in their vehicles? So at first, Ford was very skeptical, and they thought that their supply chain doesn't extend back to Brazil. When I presented them the evidence that it does via Canada, they took it very seriously, and they issued a statement that said, we are committed to responsible sourcing that respects human rights in a clean environment, and we are now looking into these allegations as a result of your inquiry. Do you anticipate that they will change their source of aluminum for their trucks? The trouble with changing your source of aluminum is that there really isn't any other supply. The only solution here is to clean up the standards at the origin. We began this story talking about how people who live around both the mines and the refineries claim that they've become very sick and that it has damaged the environment. Where are these lawsuits now? What is the status of these cases? The case that's being brought in the Netherlands is scheduled for hearings in the coming months. The court already ruled that it has jurisdiction over what is happening in Brazil because North Hydro has subsidiaries and operations in the Netherlands. So what's going to happen there is that people from the area in Barcarena around the refinery are going to fly to the Netherlands and talk about how their health and their livelihoods have been impacted by the refinery and what they say is the pollution being caused by Norsk Hydro. Environmental laws in Brazil are very weak. Even if you had strong laws on the books, the justice system often just does not work. Prosecutors in Brazil will openly tell you that they don't have the tools to go out and punish cases of alleged pollution. These cases will get stuck in the system for years or even decades. Ford and many other companies will need a lot more aluminum in the years ahead, not just for trucks, but for products of all kinds. Given what we're learning about where a lot of it comes from, what do we take away from this? Where do things go from here? It does seem like environmental standards need to be tightened and enforced at the source. And if the Brazilian government isn't able to do that, The companies need to take it upon themselves to improve how they operate. For multinationals that buy their raw materials from developing countries, what's legal on the ground is not a high enough bar for them to be able to say that they are responsibly sourcing their raw materials because so much is allowed on the ground. Jessica Bryce, Sheridan Presso, thanks for talking with me today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Virgolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Federica Romaniello is our producer. Our associate producer is Zenob Siddiqui. Hilda Garcia is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take. <laughs>